Chairman, and I'm delighted to be here. I should say that I am, in effect, pinch hitting for Betsy Brune. Has it already been mentioned why she's not here today? Okay, I won't explain then. Uh, redundancy is something that I really don't like redundancy, and I tend to repeat myself, so I really don't like redundancy. Um, in all seriousness, uh, the Smithsonian's ongoing dedication to research, in effect, is exemplified by today and the gathering that we have and that you're participating in. As you probably know, uh, the Smithsonian American Art Museum is in its 36th year of fellowship programs, and I've been told that among uh, the 400 or nearly 400 scholars who have come through this uh, auspicious program, there are many of you as alumni who are here today, so a special welcome to our friends and uh, former fellows back to uh, this august gathering. Um, as many of you know, the Smithsonian American Art Museum is a leader in scholarship, not simply an exhibit or exhibition and collection uh, facility, but really uh, underneath uh, a very robust place for the study, research, and publication of things on American art. And of course, the uh, journal, the American Art Journal, is uh, a prominent one which features some of the most important developments in scholarship in this field. And in addition, the databases that have been developed over the years, most specifically I'm thinking of this extraordinary inventory of American painting and sculpture, uh, which is uh, an incredible resource for scholars, not only uh, of the past, but also as we move continuously into the future. So it is very important to say that with the uh, conjunction with the Archives of American Art, we offer probably uh, one of the preeminent resources available to scholars, uh, both veteran and neophyte. I think the turnout for today's symposium is also significant vis-a-vis -vis the subject. And of course, the Smithsonian has been involved with uh, international art and the context of international art for many, many years. Uh, certainly the Freer and Sackler Museum, our oldest museum uh, of art in the Smithsonian, uh, along with the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the African, the National Museum of African Art, and even the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, all conjunct, uh, conjunctively uh, create an extraordinarily rich and diverse um, context for the study and consideration of international art vis-a-vis -vis American art as well. And I shouldn't uh, go on without mentioning the Latino uh, center, as well as the uh, Asian, uh, excuse me, the Pacific American programs that uh, you, you have heard about, I think, in the past. And before I go into the introduction of our, our, our special uh, keynote speaker today, I just want to take a moment. She's probably already been thanked. I missed the beginning, but my dear friend Elizabeth Glassman from the Terra Foundation for American Art is here, and that's also a reflection, uh, I strongly believe, in a unique partnership between this particular museum and its efforts to bring greater understanding, insight, and meaning to the study of American art within this global context. Uh, they, too, have this dual citizenship of American art uh, and a European base. And so it's great to see you, Liz. I'm uh, looking forward to visiting. And we're very, very grateful uh, for this uh, gift of allowing us to stage this. Now, the context, of course, is American art in a global context. And uh, I can think of no better speaker uh, than Adam Gopnik for this. Uh, this may be in your program, so forgive me if I am repeating. But Adam has been many things in his illustrious career. Uh, I first came into contact with him through his youthful co-organization of the provocative exhibition, High and Low, Modern Art and Popular Culture, though I had read many things he had written in The New Yorker for years. But that exhibition at the Museum of Art really brought Adam's thinking, which it turns out, very appropriately, came out of scholarship and research he did as a graduate student at the Institute of Fine Arts in New York University under the um, tutelage, I guess you would say, 
of William Rubin, one of the great Picasso scholars, and it was the relationship of Picasso to caricature which engendered uh, between his uh, later very dear friend, Kirk Varnado, uh, then chief curator, painting and sculpture at MoMA, this exhibition that was both provocative and uh, wonderfully stimulating uh, for the studying the fusion, which is really what we're talking about in global context of, in this case, high art and uh, contemporary uh, popular culture uh, of various times. Adam from 1987 to 1995 served as the New Yorker's art critic. Uh, and when he elected to move to Paris uh, and to write from there, he moved out of the world of art criticism, but not entirely, uh, into the world of essays, which he had been writing for many years. And in the year 2000, published a collection of essays entitled Paris to the Moon, which of course for me is Jackie Gleason, uh, but it is to uh, the moon indeed with so many uh, uh, associations, which was called by the New York Times the finest book on Paris, uh, I'm sorry, on France in recent years and became a nationwide bestseller. During those several years in Paris, Adam also authored The King in the Window, which was an adventure novel, or I should say is an adventure novel, and this quote is uh, amusing, not so much for children of all ages, but for adults of any condition, which uh, <laughs> I think speaks uh, volumes. Um, this was published last year, and it was cited as a spectacularly fine children's novel, children's literature of the highest order, which means literature of the highest order indeed. Uh, he has edited an anthology of Americans in Paris uh, for the Library of America, <laughs> and has written introductions uh, to the new editions of works for Maupassant, Balzac, and Proust. His new book, which I believe is about to come out, uh, I may be back uh, uh, out of date by a few months, but is entitled Through the Children's Gate, A Home in New York, which collects and expands many of his essays from the past five years about life in New York, raising his two children with his wife, uh, and responding to various levels of sadness and, and melancholia. It includes uh, bumping into Mr. Ravioli about his daughter's imaginary friend who is always too busy to play with her. And, uh, on, uh, and it ends with the last of the Metrozoids uh, about the last year of Kirk Varnado's life. And uh, both of these stories, by the way, are being developed as uh, and adapted for film by Sony Pictures. So, if you've read those essays or will, uh, you can look to see them realized uh, in dramatic ways. Adam has been a very active and wide-ranging lecturer, appearing in uh, virtually every major city in uh, North America. Uh, he, his formal and extended lectures have been presented at the New York Public Library, at the Phillips here in Washington, at the Whitney uh, in New York City. He even recently hosted an hour-long film for BBC London entitled Lighting Up New York. Adam has won the National Magazine Award for Essays and for Criticism an unprecedented three times, as well as the George Polk Award for Magazine Reporting. He indeed lives in New York City with his wife and their two children. Please welcome critic, author, and father, Adam Gopnik. Adam? Thank you, Nick. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, despite everything Ned said just now, I stand before you tonight as a failure. Um, I am now uh, 22 years ABD, <laughs> which will mean something to the scholars in the room. I finished my, uh, my orals in September of 1984 and promised to have my dissertation in shortly. Um, <laughs> And I am a failure, too, uh, in that I've had a contract to write a book about American art now for 17 years <laughs> and have yet to turn in the manuscript. Um, and I mention those two real failures because they um, halo or surround my talk to you tonight. I sat in the back through this afternoon's session and was acutely aware of all of the things I don't know and that members of this audience do know and of all of the ways in which I am inadequate to address 
the deep subjects and the particular subjects of American art and its continuities. However, that has not stopped me from <laughs> trying to make up for those failures by giving you tonight my PhD thesis, my book, <laughs> and a chapter on aesthetics and trying to crowd it into the next 45 minutes or so. I want tonight to talk about some of the things that the members of the panel were talking about just moments ago, about the nature of aesthetic intuitions and national traditions. I want then to talk in some detail about a few uh, cases, a few exemplars of our own national traditions, and talk about how they produce those aesthetic intuitions. And finally, I want to talk about a larger picture of what our national traditions might be, might mean, and why they matter to us. I am well aware that I am biting off far more than, than I can chew and far more than you can swallow. But as I tried to prepare this lecture over the past year, I just felt one thing leading urgently into the next. It seemed to me there was no way that you could discuss the unity of American art without talking about a lot and without trying to talk about big things. Um, I will go tonight from thorny aesthetics into pedantic art historical instance, into political polemic, and end in semi-hysterical mystical vision. <laughs> but I think you would agree with me that overcharge and hyperambition are characteristically American things. <laughs> and if you will forgive Audubon the expanse of his ambition or Church the scale of his paintings, I hope you will forgive me. Um, the immediate cause of this, of my talk tonight and the, and the form it takes and so on, is that it's not every day, every morning that you wake up and find yourself caught in a tussle, in a war between your brilliant and beloved younger brother and a neocon ideologue. But, and it's especially a rare morning when you wake up and find yourself caught in a dialogue or in a battle between a beloved and brilliant brother and a neocon ideologue and having a certain sympathy for the neocon ideologue. <laughs> I refer here uh, to my brother Blake who writes um, as the chief art critic of the Washington Post and fills that job with a commitment and a vigor and an intensity of purpose that shames his older brother's dilantism every day. Um, who, when this institution opened, as some of you will know, um, questioned in the pages of the Post, questioned with great urgency and great cogency, the whole notion of an American art and asked, is there such a thing as American art? Are we not playing into kinds of kitsch stereotypes of Americanness by insisting on the continuity of American art. And he raised the question of Pollock and said, if Pollock were French, if Pollock were a French artist, wouldn't we be pointing out all the things in Pollock that are inevitably and inextricably French? We'd be pointing out his control of the decorative surface, his love of spindly line, his clear relation to Watteau and the Rococo. There could be no painter <laughs> in the world more French than Jackson Pollock, in fact. <laughs> And that's a kind of critique that I think many of you in the audience will sympathize with and will practice. In fact, it's a kind of critique of the whole essentialized idea of American art that's become uh, quite commonplace, I think, in the academic world, though it still remains hugely provocative and challenging uh, in the larger world outside. And sure enough, um, only a couple of days later, uh, David Brooks shot back at my little brother and said um, that there was something profoundly decadent about this notion that there was no essence to American art, that this was self-evident, that Blake Gottmick spoke for what he called the art establishment, and for one who could remember when Blake couldn't speak at all, that was quite <laughs> pleasing, <laughs> and that those of us who were in the art establishment, those of us who were corrupt liberals and decadents, believed somehow that there was, and I quote, no transcendent thing we Americans share simply because we happen to inhabit the same no nation. And said instead that most people who tour these museums, the museums we're in tonight, will feel a transcendent thing called Americanness deep in their bones. A transcendent thing called Americanness deep in their bones. And I felt, as I said a moment ago, somewhat torn, somewhat pulled apart, because in fact, uh, that transcendent thing called Americanist, though I wouldn't think of it as transcendent, and I don't know that I would necessarily think of it as a thing, is something that I have intuited and tried to write about uh, 
over the 20 more years that I've been writing for The New Yorker and those years that I've been thinking about American art. That is to say that I think that we do, in fact, have very strong and powerful intuitions that Jackson Pollock is an American artist in a meaningful way, and that those intuitions aren't simply things that we arrive at after we have the information. They're not simply things we see in the rearview mirror, but they're things that we feel in a very profound uh, and gut level way. One of my favorite stories about that kind of aesthetic intuition about American art involves exactly Pollock and this kind of Pollock, and it involves that great matchless Mandarin of art history, Kenneth Clark. Some of you may remember that Clark writes in his wonderful autobiography uh, about being in Venice in the late 40s to see a, a Bellini exhibition, being there for two weeks to go day after day to see Bellini, a great favorite of his, as of mine, and turning a corner and seeing this picture in a gallery and saying to himself, my God, this is the Walt Whitman of painting. And walking in, having no idea of who Pollock was or what Pollock was, and indeed having that intuition confirmed that here was something in American art that had the stature and some of the vision of Whitman in American poetry. By the way, the dates work, the exhibitions both were taking place at the same time, and I think Clark is telling the truth when he, uh, <laughs> when he gives us evidence of that intuition. And I think we all, or many of us, have had intuitions like that, have had strong feelings that there is something in American art that is American, that isn't American in a, in a crude or, or narrowly flag-waving way, but that has something to do with common traditions, common feelings, common experiences, something that does indeed make Pollock an American artist. And some of you uh, may have heard me over the last 20 years struggling uh, to make sense out of those ideas in a lecture that I gave in many different places over a long period of time, always in an unsatisfactory way, <laughs> called The Luminous Oblong Blur in the Overabundant Larder, in which I tried to talk <laughs> about the two basic tendencies in American art, both of them extremely familiar, and horrible cliches, in fact, to anybody who does, who is an Americanist. On the one hand, the move towards the sublime out of landscape, the move towards the luminous oblong blur, as the 1920s evangelist described, his vision of God, um, the idea that we can arrive at uh, not merely the sublime, but the transcendent, the absolute, the divine, through uh, the hazy, the undefined, the open-ended, and the abstract, on the one hand, and on the other hand, the move in American art, and I show you here Audubon's wonderful common mouse, the move in American art towards a kind of empiricism as absolute as our transcendentalism, a belief that the real path for art lies not just in realism, but in a kind of mad empirical inventory, as in Audubon's determination to draw a picture of every American bird and every American beast in democratic disorder. Um, and it seemed to me that that second vision was one that not only took an Audubon, but that connected Audubon to someone like a great favorite of mine, Wayne Thiebaud, and I'll show you here cakes from the National Gallery, um, and that taste for an inventory of common effects uh, a catalog of ordinary things. And the, that uh, empiricism, even more than realism, was another and equally strong strain that connected American art and brought it together. Um, to paraphrase Shakespeare, you could say that on the one hand we had uh, an expensive spirit, and the other a spirit of expense in a <laughs> sadness of waste. So I knew when I was reading my brothers, well, I'll call them Gopniks, attack that one of the people on the line in a certain sense was myself, in fact. And my own strong sense, argued unsuccessfully, but argued over a great deal of time, that there were meaningful traditions in American art. Not necessarily essences, but powerful and moving and engaging continuities of vision. And this was something, and I'll talk about this more later, that was only reinforced for me, only made a much stronger feeling for me when I lived, as I did for six years abroad, in France and felt the pull of American culture, as I think all expatriates feel the pull of their home culture, even as they resist it, even as they have, in fact, fled it. Well, what can we make of those intuitions? What should we say about them? Um, we can announce that we have them, that we have an aesthetic intuition that connects uh, Audubon and Thiebaud, but uh, intuitions are not necessarily right. In fact, intuitions are often wrong. What, after all, is the most powerful intuition that we possess? It's that the sun rises in the east in the morning and sets in the west 
at night. This intuition, however powerfully we feel it, is wrong. Uh, it simply doesn't correspond to the facts. And the question, I think, one of the questions that's before this weekend, uh, before us all, is are our intuitions of continuities in American art like the intuition that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? Is it simply a misunderstanding about the way the real world really works, however deeply we may want to believe in it? Or does it represent something that we can make rational, that we can argue about? And I think it tends to be the case that aesthetic intuitions, at least, are things that in a certain sense um, are themselves intuitive. That is to say, if somebody tells us that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, um, we can convince them that it doesn't, actually. But if somebody tells us, for instance, that the night looks beautiful to them and the morning sublime, rather than the other way around, in some deep way we can't dissuade her or him from that position. We can call it eccentric or build a new aesthetic from it. But that in a certain sense, um, aesthetics are simply the sum of our analyzed intuitions. So let me try and analyze some of them. Maybe I can drain a little bit of the melodrama from the quarrel about the possible continuities of American art, about the validity of those intuitions which so many of us over the centuries of American life have possessed about that continuity. Um, if we move outside the realm of high art, which evokes and creates in us so many kinds of uh, internal struggles, so many times of taboos and so many kinds of uncertainties, and look at things outside the normal realm of high art. I show you here a cartoon by one of my favorite American artists, uh, James Thurber. And the caption reads, of course, it's a naive domestic burgundy without any breeding, but I think you'll be amused by its presumption. <laughs> and the gentleman on the far right, a wine canoiser, as we used to say, <laughs> is voicing this view. And I've always loved this cartoon as a wonderful joke on and parody of the language of wine appreciation, in fact, too. This is a wildly overcharged statement about what is in the 1930s when this cartoon was made, simply a cheap uh, bit of California Burgundy. Well, one of the striking things for me coming home to America, we can bring the lights up a second here. I'm going to talk rather than. One of the things that was most striking to me when I came home to America in the year 2000 as a Francophile and somebody who lived in France and loved French wine, was how much better American Pinot Noir had become than the main body of French wine. This was a painful admission to make, hard thing to, uh, to believe, but whereas in art we can, if we're forced to, fake it to some degree, in wine drinking we really can't fake it when we're at home at night, in fact. It's simply the cost in taste is just too great. Um, <laughs> And therefore, I got to thinking about American Pinot Noir because it suddenly struck me that the subject of this cartoon, which I'd loved for so many years, is, in fact, American Pinot Noir. That's what a naive domestic Burgundy is, in fact. Um, that's exactly what it is. But then you, if you think about what's involved in that story, you have a story about something that is as national as anything can be, something that you simply grow in the soil and stamp on not with your bare feet, but we'll imagine for a second, something that is as natural as something can be, and that at the same time is part of a cultural tradition. Why is that the case? Well, why is American Pinot Noir so good? It's partly because of American technological know-how. It's partly because, though my friend Jim Jensen at the Clara Vineyards tried for a long time to reproduce the uh, soil, the limestone soil of Burgundy and find places in California where you could find soil of the same kind and grow grapes in those same uh, conditions. Finally, the second generation of winemakers said, it's not Burgundy. We live in a different climate. We're going to grow in the sunshine. We're going to grow big, fat, sweet grapes, and we're going to press big, fat, sweet wines, in fact. Well, why sweet? One of the other things that's overwhelming to you when you come back to America is how much incidental sugar there is in every element of the American <laughs> diet. It's quite overwhelming, this sweet tooth of the United States. And we could discuss all the reasons why that is. And some of them are conspiratorial because the sugar producers want your kids addicted to sugar. And some of them are, if you like, aesthetic. That's because we genuinely relish the big sweet taste of overripe fruit or overripe wines. Well, my point, as I'm sure you see, is simply that even if we take something uh, as seemingly natural, as seemingly unmediated, if you like, as a bottle of Pinot Noir, what we get is a tradition. It's a tradition that begins 
across the sea. It begins as a naive attempt to mimic or imitate French wine to make a domestic Burgundy. But in fact, over time and for a complex of reasons, becomes something that is so distinctly American that when you come back from France and you come home, jet lagged from the flight, and you open a bottle, it immediately breathes with the smell, the distinctive and ineffable essence of California. Um, that is the way, it seems to me, that we can talk meaningfully about cultural traditions, not as national essences that come out of nowhere or from some mystical uh, other realm, but as things that are made by the intersection of our tradition and our encounters with alien forces that begin as naive domestic burgundies but end up as immensely sophisticated and still distinctly American Pinot Noirs. If that instance seems to you too narrowly uh, uh, sensual or sensory, I think you could see the same thing at a much higher level of, of abstract thought. If you think about the history of romantic love in the 19th century, the idea of romantic love. Edmund Wilson has a wonderful essay about the role that the American idea of romantic love plays in 19th century English fiction, for instance. We, for a variety of reasons having to do with the less cl classed on nature of our society, were sort of propagandists for romantic love in England in trying to convince a country where the upper classes still believed in arranged marriages between classes that romantic love was the way to go. And if any of you read Trollope, the American senator, or the Duke's children, the disruptive force in the novel is an American girl or young man who arrives and says, why can't I marry whom I choose? Why can't I marry whom I love? And the whole society disintegrates momentarily around that declaration, although it eventually reconciles itself to that idea. And that notion of romantic love, of personal fulfillment through marriage, is something that still haunts uh, English society right up to the time of uh, Charles and Diana and the notion of the pursuit of happiness over the pursuit of duty. The point I'm making is that there are lots of things that are not necessarily loaded that we can talk about in a very straightforward, rational way. We can pick out all the little pieces and all the little moments when they came to us, why they, we can argue about why they came to us. We can talk about them as national traditions. And as we do, we don't have to invest in any sense in essences, in mysterious transcendence. We're just talking history in the narrow way that history should be taught. Narrow at the beginning and wide at the end. And I think that we see exactly the model of the naive domestic Burgundy blossoming into uh, American Pinot Noir almost wherever you look in the history of American art. Um, and I particularly, in the 1980s, got uh, interested in what seemed to me at a time when a great deal of uh, the writing and the rhetoric of American art history had emphasized the romantic tradition. It emphasized the tradition that passed from the luminous through to the abstract expressionist as being a main line of American romanticism, a main line by which the 19th century America got connected, uh, after many twists and turns and curlicues, to 20th century America. I got uh, turned on by, drawn to, as I said a few moments ago, to uh, the complementary, or even, if you like, the opposed tradition in American art, which I called, for lack of a better name, the eccentric empirical tradition, a tradition that seemed to me to have its origin point in, the, for me, still the great Giotto of American art, Audubon, and that passed on through many another uh, uh, artist that was, had uh, very, very familiar signposts, uh, Homer and Aikens uh, and Sargent, and passed right on to Edward Hopper, who is, I was fascinated to hear has pride of place as we come into uh, this museum exactly because uh, he's good for people like 19th century art will go up to Hopper and people like 20th century art will start with Hopper. And that seemed to me, uh, uh, that's true. That's, a, very, that's, a, that's a, a good insight into the way we see it. That that tradition of the eccentric empirical was richer in many ways than the tradition of the American Romantic, even though the American Romantic looked rich because you could add it on, you could uh, uh, you could transplant it uh, uh, with afterthought, with hindsight, to the uh, abstract expressionist tradition. And this was something that my friend Bob Hughes and I both wrote a great deal about in the 80s and uh, 90s and found a, a, a wonderfully vital, popular expression in Hughes's uh, American Visions, the television series and book that he wrote, where that notion that the central tradition in American art, if you like, is the empirical tradition, is, uh, is very important.
But what strikes me, and over the years, I've tried to look in a series of biographical essays, I've tried to look at the lives and work of American artists who are in that empirical tradition. And what's striking is that every time you do, and this is, I should emphasize again, this is the tradition that we sort of easily accept as American. This is the tradition that the, the amateur visitor to the museum uh, feels comfortable with in some way, Audubon and Homer and Hopper, some combination of empirical inventory and an overlying melancholia that seems to them convincing and true, doesn't need a lot of work. But every time you look at this American tradition, this most American, this most iconic of traditions, what you find is American Pinot Noir. What you find is an immense, uh, not merely an adulteration, but a set of roots that lie elsewhere. And I'm particularly interested in ones where the roots lie in France, because some of my roots lie in France, and certainly a great deal of my affection and allegiance lies there. So when we look at Audubon, who uh, as late as 1990 was still often seen as the kind of Daniel Boone or Johnny Appleseed of American art, an essentially naive figure wandering through the West making pictures of birds as he wandered around, what we find uh, is in fact not uh, a simple naive set of visions, but an intense knot of cosmopolitan ironies. Um, not naive domestic Burgundy, but Pinot Noir. Um, we all know about the uh, self-created myth that Audubon passed around of his studies with David, in fact, and we know that that was a, a fiction, a lie, if you like. But it was a very significant lie, in fact, because it, it suggested another truth. It suggested the way that uh, Audubon, as a stylist with this wonderfully cartoon-like, nearly cartoon-like clarity and definition, this insistent linearism, which we find everywhere, is very much part of uh, that moment in uh, turn of the century, uh, French and American and international art, which Robert Rosenblum uh, captured so beautifully when he talked about an international linear style in those times. Um, we know that uh, Audubon looked to France, went to France to sell his pictures, looked to France for approval. We know that these birds, far from being seen uh, uh, on the fly, are all wired in the most literal sense, caught and set up theatrically composed, and not just theatrically composed, but if you like, symbolically composed, so uh, that they're meant to recall to mind, as I wrote at the time, uh, founding fathers, uh, conquerors, uh, and we feel it very strongly in the wonderful uh, Audubon eagle upstairs, which is clearly meant to be an almost a kind of near caricature of General Washington. But when we look at Audubon, what we see is something as far removed from naivete, as far removed from a kind of emanation of American soil as something could possibly be. And in fact, uh, that understanding uh, also involves an understanding that one of the things that Audubon did was to work with certain repeated shapes that he used over and over again, simplified schemata that he used for his birds and later on for his beasts. And one of the fascinating recent acquisitions to our understanding of Audubon is, of course, in Edelman's wonderful book, Darwin's Audubon where we now know that Darwin, Charles Darwin, drew on Audubon, uh, who was not seen as a significant naturalist at that point, drew on Audubon for more evidence and information, drew exactly on the stylizations of Audubon and Audubon's sense of kinship amongst seemingly, uh, amongst apparently unrelated species, as very powerful ammunition for the origin of species, that Audubon was one of the crucial influences and one of the crucial liberating forces for Darwin. Um, so what we see when we actually look at Audubon in, in any part is not something that is narrowly or naively American, but something that is, in fact, uh, a Pinot Noir of that kind, something that comes from France, is in an intense daily dialogue with cosmopolitan experience, which ends up contributing not merely to some narrow notion of our art history or of our art or of Americana, but exactly to the fundamental remaking of Western consciousness that Darwinism represented. And it seems to me that though there are a few artists as rich uh, as Audubon, that that kind of story gets told again and again and again whenever you look at this tradition of American empiricism. And I show you here, of course, Winslow Homer in those wonderful uh, uh, engravings from the war, from the Civil War. And, uh, Homer, as I was writing, as I wrote earlier this year, is another artist who, when we first see him, uh, seems as utterly American in his pared down empiricism as any artist can be in his insistence on the single form. 
uh, in his truth and his fidelity to American experience as it was actually taking place uh, in the camps and on the lines of the Civil War, true to, to the horror of the new kind of warfare that was being practiced, and we don't get this uh, Homer sniper if we don't understand the horror that Homer said he felt at this impersonal dealing of death that he was watching and that had entered warfare in the world for the first time. But we also don't get Homer if we don't get Homer's sojourn in Paris. And there's, as many of you know, an argument in which I am in the intense minority uh, about what Homer learned in Paris and how seriously he learned from what was going on in Paris. I uh, still love and admire Albert Gardner's wonderful little book from 50 years ago where he insists on Homer's exposure to Japanese art and to French Japanism in his year in Paris in 1867, documented here in his image of the Louvre. But whether we think Homer got that idea directly from modern French art in Paris or whether we think, as I understand most of the contemporary scholarship believes, that it came later on in the 80s, in fact, from secondary sources, nonetheless, we can't see Homer, it seems to me, except again as an exemplar of a sort of international style, not so much, but as somebody who learns crucially by looking at the other, by going elsewhere. I'll show you this wonderful uh, Homer of uh, 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 Dad's Coming, uh, which uh, has in its, in its pillar-like simplifications, in its insistence on draining away the merely anecdotal into this vocabulary of half-seen faces and turned faces, so on exactly that taste for the elliptical and the eclipsed that's so much part of what he experienced and which we find again and again, this taste for the strange, the unorthodox, the inappropriate compositional idea that suddenly begins to emerge in his work. And of course, we find it even more uh, beautifully and startling in the, so many of the mature masterpieces of, uh, of Homer's work where the Japanism, where the idea uh, is so, seems so evident and so strong. Um, his relationship to, to Hokusai, among others. And however we articulate precisely that idea, I don't think we can get Homer. We can't get Homer's color. We can't get Homer's commitment to the high keyed. We can't get Homer's commitment to the figure seen from behind, his commitment to the uh, abbreviated, to the implied, to the suggestive, unless we see him in that much broader international context. We go to... Uh, uh, Prout's point and what we see, Prout's neck, I beg your pardon, we go to Prout's neck and what we see is a lot of Paris. Now, and of course the same thing I think is true in the left and right. Similar things I think could be said about Aikens and about his experience of French art and of, of the Parisian moment. Uh, in his post-war uh, uh, time in Paris, that is to say the things that look to us to be uh, as profound and as accessible and as American uh, expressions of a kind of unmediated, uh, melancholic uh, empiricism all turn out or turn out very often to have not only specific sources, that's, that's a secondary question, but to depend a great deal on the kinds of things he absorbed in France. There's a quote from Aikens which I dearly love, in fact, which it seems to me uh, touches on exactly the way that an American could sort of learn what there was to learn in Paris in the 1860s, but actually learn something that he needed. He wrote home, uh, the big artist does not sit down monkey-like and copy a coal scutter or an ugly old woman like some, some Dutch painters have done, nor a dung pile, but he keeps a sharp eye on nature and steals her tools. And here, and this next sentence has all of the rhythms that Hemingway would finally arrive at 50 years later. He learns what she does with light the big tool, and then color, then form, and appropriates them to his own use. In a big picture, you can see what o'clock it is, afternoon or morning, if it's hot or cold, winter or summer, and what kind of people are there, and what they are doing, and why they are doing it. What kind of people are there, and what they are doing, and why they are doing it. This is American realism in its first uncompromised form, honest sensations connected by ands. But it required uh, Aiken's displacement from Philadelphia to Paris for him to arrive exactly at that American vision of what a realism could be. And when we look at the Furman Four in hand, for instance, I think we're so familiar with it that we don't see the kind of mere heroism that was required for Aiken's to give up 
what many of you will know was his original idea to do a series of pictures on the history of transportation in America, a series of anecdotal pictures, and simply concentrate on the people and what they're doing and the way the light looks and the way the wheels turn. This is uh, American realism of a very profound kind, of a kind that connects to Whitman, his friend, that connects to Stephen Crane, that connects to Hemingway, that connects to a whole tradition of the stripped down, the pared down, and the essential. And yet, uh, we first discover, Aiken's discovering it, when he is displaced from Philadelphia uh, into the cosmopolitan tradition. In a completely opposite way, I think, and I wrote, tried to write at length about Mary Cassatt, Cassatt, not an artist, an American artist who goes to France and then comes back home, but an American artist who goes to France, becomes one of the very few who ever have been fully accepted by a French avant-garde milieu, but then finds something radically different to make out of the, uh, the, the reigning style of the time, out of her experience of Degas and her near marriage to him. That is an art uh, not devoted to, uh, to outer life necessarily, but who becomes in ways that I think only in the last 20 years have, that we begin to appreciate and not to condescend to or patronize to the exhaustion and heroism of mothers, in fact, and to their engagement with their children, that this is not simply a kind of decorative sidelight, but one of the fundamental draining and revivifying human tussles. Uh, Cassatt said in a wonderful way that uh, if we could only hear the philosophy of her mothers and children, we would be shocked by what they say and think. And that that idea of overrating childhood, if you like, of overrating the subject of parents and children, obviously I don't think it is overrated, but it is, it is perceived that way, um, is one that is also strikes us as a deeply American one. I'm just about to publish a book composed of stories of childhood, of watching children in New York, and that's in a very American genre, that it almost exaggerated attention to the nature of childhood. It's one thing that we can find again and again uh, in American art, and I show you this wonderful Cecilia Bow of a little girl in white, which is in the Americans in Paris show right now in Boston, because I adore this picture, um, and would use it as the cover of my own book if it were not the wrong century and the wrong time. But <laughs> the idea of something about children, the idea of childhood as a kind of uh, primal theater where innocence of the deepest kind and poison and experience of the most malevolent kind can intersect is something that we find in American writing of the period. It, it haunts our imaginations now for uh, any number of reasons. But, and it's one of the things that uh, for me at least makes Sargent's Boyd Daughters the single greatest American picture, the one American picture that can stand alongside any of Henry James's novella for the combination of surface charm and inner mystery and inner depths a picture that's in so many ways about what culture does to innocent children and how it captures them, and at the same time, a picture about the sheer beauty and uh, delight that we feel in, in watching children, in the, their, their freshness of vision and their freshness of appearance. That idea of taking the art of Europe, which has a very different view of what kids are, and making an art that is kid-centric is, again, one that is, strikes me as being profoundly American and yet only possible first through the intercession of a cosmopolitan tradition. And we could go on beyond, I show you here, uh, Edward Hopper from Hopper's, uh, coming right up to the Hopper that we were talking about before, and this is Hopper in Paris in, uh, before the First World War, 1906, I think this is, of the Pont des Arts, and is a wonderful show of uh, Hopper, uh, Hopper's work that's up at the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York right now, one of the wonderful and delightful, and for this ignoramus, uh, uh, mind-boggling things about it is, is to see how much of what we think of as being distinctly American, distinctly New York, in Hopper's lighting and in his love of lighting effects, in his love of isolation, of the long shadow, of the stilled afternoon, um, so that of, in something like this, even more strikingly, things that seem to us to belong centrally to Hopper's sense of the glaring afternoon light and the long shadows and the uh, essential enemy of American relations all begin in Paris. That in fact, uh, Hopper bottles up a particular kind of Parisian light and brings it home and sprays it everywhere he looks. In fact, and that sense of American melancholia, of longing and isolation, which Hopper passes on uh, so beautifully to uh, 
an artist like Thibault, is in fact uh, a Parisian epiphany. Not a Parisian epiphany in the sense that somebody tells him in Paris that this is the way the world should look, but that he needs to get to Paris in order to experience something that will become, to our minds, uh, essential to our own sense of identity, to our own sense of who we are, as in this wonderful picture that looks forward, not just to abstract painting, but to a, an artist like James Terrell in its use of pure light as a powerful emotive and spiritual force. Until finally, when we're looking at a wonderful picture like the, this, the early morning, the 7 a.m., we're seeing something that has, although visitors to this museum, visitors to the Whitney, come in and see it as something as, in effect, as open, as accessible as that Thurber cartoon as a Saturday evening post cover. In fact, what we're seeing is not naive domestic burgundy. What we're seeing is a great exhalation of American Pinot Noir, something brought elsewhere, learned, thought through, argued through, distilled and refined until it seems to us transparently about American experience. Now, my point here let me emphasize, is not that all of these folks, Audubon and Hopper and Cassatt, are closeted French people. Um, not at all. <laughs> My point is really just the opposite. It's that in a very practical, specific, empirical sense, we only discover the most central, the most open, the most transparent, the most seemingly accessible American tradition through a constant engagement with an other. Now, the other I've chosen to look at is France and Paris, because that's the one I know best and because it was the one that was most central uh, in the 19th century. But we could reproduce this notion anywhere we look, when we could find it in Germany or in Scandinavian art or in all, or as we were learning this afternoon, in uh, different kinds of southern confrontations uh, and up to, this, up to this day. That our very idea of what it means to be American always, always, uh, boils down under analysis to being some kind of dialogue with another tradition. What look like naive domestic burgundies all turn out to be complicated cosmopolitan clones and pressings. And that, I think, is at the heart of the argument, at the heart of the dispute, the heart of what we're dealing with. That is, that the opposition, the simple opposition between nationalism on the one hand and cosmopolitanism on the other misstates the nature of the problem and misstates the nature of the question. That is that we can't imagine uh, nationalism outside some kind of cosmopolitan context. That it's only with the accession of some broader idea of who we are that involves who we're not that we begin to define who we are nationally and that we begin to get it. Um, national traditions are made up of cosmopolitan confrontations for good and for ill. Um, I refer you to the wonderful book Cosmopolitanism by my friend Anthony Appiah, where he makes the, I think, quite profound point that nationalism, as it first began to appear in its modern sense in the 19th century, isn't, isn't the opposite of cosmopolitanism, but it's the opposite of regionalism. It's the opposite of clanism. That is to say, if you're in Poland or Hungary or uh, the Czech Republic or in the United States, you don't say, let's be national, let's look for a national identity in preference to a mixed up cosmopolitan identity, you say very often, let's put aside our petty regional identities, our petty clan identities, our petty sectarian identities, and find some common identity in a set of abstract values, in a common history, in a common tradition that can unite us rather than divide us. In that sense, of course, Lincoln is the greatest American nationalist because that's the heart of his rhetoric from the Civil War is to say exactly not, to say exactly those other people are mere sectarians. Their loyalties are simply geographic and clan loyalties. The loyalty I'm proposing to you is a loyalty of ideals, ideals of equality, ideals of democratic union, but that they are essentially abstract and overriding, not, not local, national, uh, and emanating up from the soil. Lincoln proposes a nationalism of ideas, not a regionalism of soil loyalty. So we can't have the idea, it seems to me, of national tradition or of a national art without it being positioned in some way within some sense of abstract ideas about where we draw the line about ourselves. 
And wherever we choose to draw that line may be our nation. And it can be drawn very badly, or it can be drawn very well <laughs> and, and richly. But nonetheless, those two things are not in opposition. They're in a constant and eternal dialogue, it seems to me. And that, in fact, if we go back to the, uh, the distinction I made at the beginning, the lecture I used to give about the luminous oblong blur and the overabundant larder, what I think we see there <coughs> exactly is not some uh, native domestic American tradition, narrowly put, but is exactly a kind of typically American overreading of ideas, <coughs> traditions that can be found in Europe. That is to say that we can find plenty of uh, transcendentalists, countless numbers of them in, in Europe, as we can find endless numbers of empiricists. But the American uh, insistence on doing it in almost absolute terms, in doing a, uh, an automatic painting that is, seems at least to be truly and powerfully automatic, the American insistence, which dates back to Audubon, that anything can be the appropriate subject, the mouse as well as the fox, which we find continue to reflect in our own day in pop art or in a uh, painter like Thibault and his insistence, not that cakes are necessarily interesting, but they are the thing that's there, that faith, that Whitman-esque faith in the real. Those involve um, a particular kind of fanatic overreading of things that in their original European context are often seem like mere common sense. Um, that, fin that tendency to fanatically overread uh, things that come to us from Europe uh, is part, I think, of the American tradition. It's one of the things that affects American intellectual life so deeply, so that you can see, if you spend time in France, the difference between the way uh, French post-structuralist philosophy is read in France, that is, is a series of uh, kind of individual riffs, and the way that it's typically read in America, that is, is a set of uh, biblical commandments. <laughs> and I think, let me add, that I think I'm going to, I will skip over the, uh, uh, the detail point. I think that's one of the reasons, <coughs> on the good side of it, that American art is central. We have an extraordinarily rich artistic tradition, it seems to me, one for which we need not apologize at all. And it comes to be so rich, I think, in part because we are, we have a habit of fanatic overreading, a habit of fanatic overcommitment. And that can be very bad for our philosophy, and it can be very bad often for our criticism, but it's very good for our art, because art finally is a question, it seems to me, very often of fanaticism, of commitment, of a belief that if you just get the cakes right, you can rival any artist, any painter there's ever been. And that was one of the insights, and my talk mentioned Santayana's boomerang, that I owe to George Santayana, who um, many of you will know for the one dumb thing he ever said. He said that those who do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. Since we seem doomed to repeat it in any case, this turns out not to be true. But Santayana <laughs> was an extraordinary intellectual, a man who came from abroad and assimilated into an American milieu and then abandoned it rather dramatically in the mid 19th century and wrote in the mid 20th century, I apologize, and then wrote a wonderful book called Character and Opinion in the United States. And what he talked about in Character and Opinion in the United States, he was trying to understand in the terms of uh, 19th century philosophy, why William James's pragmatism had produced in one generation Hosea Royce's idealism, the two absolutely radically opposed extremes, one coming right after another. And he said, <coughs> that's the boomerang of American life. All American life is built around a boomerang. You can't help but go from, uh, pardon, from that to that in a state. You can't help but going from the overwhelming, the transcendent, the random, the uh, to the narrow and the empirical because they're both parts of one continuous vision. They're, they're extreme ends of one field. And I think that there's considerable truth in that. I think that that is one of the things that gives American art its vitality and its intensity is exactly its tendency to boomerang uh, from one state to another, uh, a tendency which, as I say, I think enfeebles our philosophy very often and our criticism very often, but uh, uh, invigorates our art. But having said all that, and having run through all that, I think a deeper question is, returning to the politics we first looked at, why do we care? What difference does it make? We can, tonight or in the weekend to come, we can argue about the fine details of this vision. We can argue about exactly what Homer did or did not learn in Paris. We can argue about 
what Hopper brought to Paris and what he took away. We can argue about whether the uh, uh, romantic transcendental and the eccentric empirical is the right ping pong around which to play with American art or if there's some other duality that will work as well as doubtless it would. What does it matter? It's a kind of game that we all like to play, but why should anyone really care? And I think we need to care because how we define our art, how we define the continuities of our art, is crucial to how we define ourselves. And if we accept the notion that there is either a kind of transcendental Americanism that emanates from our soil on the one hand, or, or the notion that, uh, any, that our tendency to see things as American is a pure accident, is just a kind of mistake of nominalism, we can call anything American that we want, that we lessen our, the connection that art makes as a transmitter between ourselves and the world around us. I never expected to be giving this lecture on this day, which seems to me a tragic day in American history, uh, a day when traditions and beliefs that we have held for hundreds of years are under assault, in which so many of us feel passively incapable of doing anything about uh, acting uh, against them, uh, in, which, uh, I, in which we're being asked to accept uh, Orwellian euphemisms for torture, in which we're being asked to accept the notion that uh, uh, aliens to our shore can be picked up and uh, uh, imprisoned uh, eternally at one man's whim. It seems to me that those of us who work this particular vineyard, who work along this particular line, can at least say that is not the America we know, that is not the American tradition that we know. That the American traditions that we really know are not traditions of narrow insularism, are not traditions uh, where we enclose ourselves against the world, that the art that seems to us most American, most expressive of our experience and potentialities as people, the art of Audubon, the art of Homer, the art of Hopper, that all of these arts could only exist not through the influence of the other, of the alien, but through a direct, daily, struggling confrontation with the other that the very things that seem to us most deeply and meaningfully American come out of a constant openness, a constant turning outward uh, to other people, to other experiences. That's what America is. If there's a continuity in American art, it depends on that. It depends on the very fact that Pollock is utterly dependent on European surrealism and on Picasso that Pollock cannot be circumscribed as any kind of American or Greenwich Village regionalist, but that at the same time we recognize in his work uh, uh, elements and, and aspects that only make sense that we can understand in American terms. My book, Paris the Moon, was, and appropriately I think in many ways, read as a comedy of domestic manners. And indeed it was. But it had or tried to make a serious point at its end. Some of you may remember that it ends with the birth of a baby in Paris in the year 1999, on September 11th, 1999, as it happens. And the joke, the comedy of that section was about how utterly French every element of that delivery was. Um, our, the man who gave us a sonogram wore a black silk shirt and smoked as he did it. Uh, <laughs> I say us, my wife. Um, the, uh, I had to, we had to dress the baby for ourselves. Um, the sexual act which had initiated this thing far from being hidden behind a veil of the medicinal was talked about openly. And yet, and yet, uh, at the end, at the end when we finally had the baby among us, what we were experiencing, and this is what I tried to write about, was something that was not merely universally human, but universally mammalian, the simple act of reproduction that we all take part in. And at that moment, as I write in the book, I had the closest thing I've ever had to a moment of revelation or religious vision, which was simply that the truth does not lie somewhere in the middle when it comes to discussing national identity and universalism, when it comes to, discu to discussing local identity and the cosmopolitan. It lies in the truth of both extremes at their most extreme. That is, that uh, culture articulates and defines in the most narrow and local way everything we do. You can't have a baby in Paris in anything like the way you have a baby in New York. Every twist and turn of the nine months is differently articulated and differently felt. And at the same time, 
and that you can't overstate how profound that cultural articulation is. And at the same time, what you end up with is a baby, a singularity in time, in fact, to which all of mammalian history, in a sense, has been pointing for its very beginning. Both those accounts are profoundly true, and they're both true at the same time. And the only mistake we make is trying to merge them, make them meet in the middle, rather than accepting what seems to me the fundamental human truth, that they are simultaneously true, and in both ways, in their extreme case. Well, I told you I would end with a semi-mystical moment, and that's not it. <laughs> it's coming. Oops, let me come back here a second. It's this. If there's a deeper question, I've said I want, love this weekend and this occasion and this museum to be dedicated not just to the narrow questions of who did what, when, and who should we include how, but to the deeper questions of why it matters, why we should bother about American art or any art at all. And that question of why we should bother about any art at all is one that I think has to haunt anybody who thinks or writes about art. It certainly haunt, has haunted me in the 15 years that I've been away from writing about art regularly. After all, we live in a world where so many of the traditional functions of the visual arts, certainly of painting and sculpture, have been uh, pulled away by the presence of the media, by the domination of photography, now ever more by the presence of, of video image and the media image. And why do we come back here? Why do we come to museums at all? Is it simply a kind of uh, cultural reflex, a sort of nostalgic uh, uh, habit? that we've had again and again? Is it a form of a way of absorbing a certain set of snob values of defining ourselves in some Biblian sense as belonging to one group rather than another? I think not. And I think that when we look at any first rate now and has to be dealt with as something that is here and entirely present, and at the same time something that belongs to another time that has to be historically conjugated and historically understood, something that is simultaneously culturally articulated and only culturally articulated, and something at the same time that is alive now. That's true, I know, of all culture and all art, but not to the degree that it's true of the visual arts. Uh, books float from one edition to another, from one time to another, in a sea of signifiers. Music uh, is inert on the notated page and then suddenly alive before us. Only the visual arts, it seemed to me, have the specific quality of being simultaneously uh, mammalian, present, physical, material, if you like, geological rather than mammalian, I should say, and also being so clearly uh, articulate as unique cultural properties. Um, art and painting, from here and me, is present and past. It teaches us that we are entirely made up of what we are, and we entirely make up what we are. And we have to ask ourselves again and again how that thing we make up is like other people's constructions. It enables us, when we think about the American tradition, it seems to me, to say with Thurber, who remarks of this young woman, she has the true Emily Dickinson spirit, except that she gets fed up occasionally, that we can have the true Emily Dickinson, or the true Audubonian, or the true Homeric, or the true Hopperite experience, and get fed up with it, occasionally, or more often than occasionally, that we can believe in the continuities of American art, we can believe in a continuous tradition, and at the same time, not be enslaved by it, not be turned by it into narrow or insular nationalists, but be liberated by it to become true cosmopolitans. Thank you very much.